Dear colleagues and students, my name is Lavinia Cerioni and I am a Marie Curie Fellow at Aarhus University. I have prepared a series of videos on women in early Christianity. It's entitled Feminine Soul Care in Patristic Times. This is the first video and I hope you will enjoy it. The idea of proposing such a short course sprouts from the intention to explore further the results achieved in the past 30 years in the field of women's studies in early Christianity. In particular, the next three videos aim at introducing the broader public, students and younger colleagues to this specific field of investigation. What then the course aim? Well, the first aim is to, let's say, challenge the idea that early Christianity was a men's world, because it was not. Uh, numerous studies have proven this and have proven that women, just as men, were involved in uh, frontline duties in early Christian communities. What were frontline duties? Well, they were involved in pastoral care, they were involved in ministry, uh, they often offered their houses or their wealth uh, for the community and they were active, important members of these early Christian communities. So, in general, what I'm proposing is an introduction to women's studies in early Christianity through textual, archaeological and artistic evidence. In this regard, uh, it must be said that there is a major problem when dealing with early Christian sources about women. Because if it is true that Christianity was not a man's world, uh, it is nonetheless true that it, it is a world that we know mainly through a masculine lens. In fact, the texts we have have been written by men, um, mural paintings were painted by men, all the sources we have have been bequeathed to us by men. So how can we deal with such a disadvantaged starting point? Well, the first step is surely to acknowledge the risk that what we know is the men's worldview and the men's view of women. Um, once we have acknowledged this, I would say that the second step uh, is to contextualize the primary sources in their geographical, linguistical, social and cultural background. Why? Because context can help us reaching a plausible or a, at least the most plausible historical analysis and historical reconstruction. What is then the purpose of this short course? Definitely, I would like to promote awareness of the rich cultural diversity and gender heterogeneity proper to early Christian movements. Christian diversity was not limited to the men-women dichotomy. It was characterized by the inclusion of different social groups like rich and poor and the cultural inclusion of different uh, beliefs like Jews and Gentiles alike and the intellectual inclusion of Christians with different creeds. In fact, contrary to what is commonly believed, there was no such thing as orthodoxy before the third, even fourth century after Christ. And Christianity was not a monolithic belief. It has never been. Moreover, I would like to give an overview of the social, religious and cultural status of women in the first three centuries of Christianity, which I believe is particularly important because it allows the modern interpreter to have a feeling of what women's life was like. Lastly, I would like to develop critical thinking by further engaging with independent reading. In fact, I will suggest some bibliographical coordinates and I will make occasional references to bibliography, both in the video and in the written version of this uh, short course that you find attached to the video. 
lastly, before going deeper into the, this argument, I believe we have to ask one, ourselves uh, an important question. That is, why does it matter in the 21st century talking about women in early Christian communities? Well, obviously there is a certain degree of subjectivity to what I'm going to say here, because I, I believe the answer can vary a lot from person to person. In my case, I believe that our social, cultural and intellectual understanding of women is grounded, even nowadays, on Christian intellectual and social history. And knowledge of women history means female empowerment even nowadays, because by acknowledging women's importance in early Christianity, we can take together a further step towards promoting a change in contemporary Christianity and in contemporary society. So it does still matter in the 21st century to be aware and to know how women lived two dozen years ago. Well, it is now time to begin this journey into early Christianity. We will start from those women who are mentioned in the New Testament and are also the immediate followers of Jesus. The picture you have here uh, in the slide is the well-known mural painting by Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. But contrary to the popular belief which followed the success of the Da Vinci Code, the book uh, by Dan Brown, um, there is no Mary Magdalene, there is, no, there is not a woman among the disciples because the woman who's supposed to be Mary Magdalene is actually a man and it's probably John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. So, nonetheless, um, um, despite the fact that the book was wrong about the painting, uh, it is historically accurate to say that women were indeed followers of Jesus and that many of them uh, had prominent roles within the first Christian communities. But did Jesus care for women? Scholars have long debated whether Jesus was a feminist or not, but there is no general consensus. On the contrary, modern scholarship is divided on this topic, especially feminist scholarship. Moreover, this is a problematic question to be asked, because it is a question that does not emerge from the text. We pose such a question because it belongs to us. Us as 21st century interpreters of a first century text. Here, we risk turning it into a test about the degree of feminism or even support of patriarchy that we find in a text that does not belong to the 21st century. What I'm saying does not want to diminish the importance of asking these questions when they have to do with the value that these works have for our modern times and our contemporary lives. However, if we look at this text from an historical perspective, I believe we must engage with the text by letting the question emerge from the text rather than imposing questions on the evangelical narrative. It is the same reason why we use a male-female paradigm when discussing the topic of gender in the New Testament, without going into further details discussing the modern and complex matter of gender identification. The dichotomic gender paradigm male-female is proper to the text and we should take it into consideration as such if we want to approach the text from an historical perspective. So if we do accept this methodology and this approach, what can we say and of what can we be sure when we talk about Jesus and women? We can certainly be sure that Jesus' message is destined for both men and women, because we can see it from the rhetorical analysis of Jesus' discourse. We can be sure that many women, many women became followers of Jesus because it is confirmed not only from evangelical sources, but also from external sources like Pliny's letter. 
Third, we can be sure that some women of the early Christian communities were active members of the community. And they were active members as leaders, as ministers, as deacons, and they had key roles in the structure and the, in the hierarchy of the community. How can we be sure that Jesus' message was meant for women? In this matter, the rhetorical analysis of the New Testament is greatly helpful because it casts light on how Jesus addressed his audience and to what extent New Testament authors were interested in women's inclusion. For instance, it is commonly believed that Luke, the author of the Gospel in Acts, was more interested than others in women's narrative because he underlines numerous times that women were indeed Jesus' disciple. On the contrary, Paul is a very controversial New Testament author, as we will see in the second video, because he discusses the role of women in early Christian community, mostly in a pejorative sense, although not exclusively. When it comes to the Gospel, uh, I believe it is important to underline the difference between two different narrative perspectives. We can have an androcentric narrative perspective and a gynocentric narrative perspective. Why? What does it mean? Well, an androcentric perspective means that we have text that speaks for men and about men. And the opposite is the four texts who are meant for women and who speaks about women. Generally speaking, we believe that the Gospels are wholly androcentric, but they are not. There are a lot of texts that they are meant for women as well as for men. There is not an exact balance, as some scholars believe, between androcentric and gynocentric narrative perspectives. Nonetheless, it is an error to believe that the Gospels, uh, the message in it, was not meant for women and that they were not included in uh, um, Jesus' discourse. Because the rhetorical analysis of Jesus' sayings confirms that Jesus addressed women and men, and in particular, I would like to focus the attention on what is called a gendered pairs. What are gendered pairs or gendered couplets? These are examples of parables present in Jesus' sayings, which are told twice. One time they feature a male example and another time they feature a female example. Even when it does not make sense to repeat an episode twice from a narrative perspective. These gendered pairs of couplets have been studied by several scholars, but I would like to examine a little bit more in depth uh, Sarah Park's works on gendered pairs in Q, because I, she has a really neat focus on uh, Jesus' sayings. For those of you who do not know, Q is the common source of the Synoptic Gospels, and it is a collection of Jesus' sayings. So let's take an example and read the text. In Q 15.45a, we have the so-called parable of the lost sheep. This parable is present in Matthew, Luke and in the Gospel of Thomas. In Q1579, we have a parable which is instead present only in the Gospel of Luke and is the parable of the lost coin. These two parables have the same exact structure and they feature the same episode, but one time we have a male main character and then a female main character. Let's read it through. Which man is there among you who has a hundred sheep? On losing one of them will not leave the ninety-nine in the mountains and go hunt for the lost one. And if it should happen that he finds it, I say to you that he rejoices over it more 
then over the 99 that did not go astray. This is an example where we have a main character that's a male and we have a lost sheep that is found and then rejoice. Let's read the, the female version of it. Or what woman who has tongue coins, if she were to lose one coin, would not light a lamp and sweep the house and hunt until she finds. And on finding, she calls the friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Now, from a narrative perspective, it doesn't make really much sense to have these two episodes in a gospel. And in the Gospel of Luke, they're quite close because they are both episodes of the 15th chapter of the Gospel. So why should the author of the Gospel put these two examples one after the other? There is no narrative need for both examples, apart from the fact that he's trying to include both the male audience and the female audience. So in the gendered pairs, we find a confirmation of the fact that Jesus' message is meant for both men and women. Now, not all gendered pairs are explicit as in this case. Sometimes we find gendered pairs that are implicit. So they feature a typically male or female object or a typically female and male activities. You can find the complete list uh, in the written text that it's uh, attached to the video. And I invite you to go through them because it's extremely interesting to see how many times this happened. Having established that Jesus' message was meant for women, what do we know about the women who were among Jesus' disciples? In Luke 8, 1, 3, we read, Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their own means. If one reads from the Greek, it seems that Luke is here identifying two groups, the twelve and the women. This passage is particularly important also because it follows the account of the sinful woman who has washed Jesus' feet with her tears and it precedes the parable of the sower. So from the position we can see that Luke is creating the narrative of women present in Jesus' life and among Jesus' followers. Two of these women, Mary Magdalene and Joanna, are also the same that we find again in the 24th chapter of Luke because are those who visited Jesus' empty tomb, witnessed the angelic message and reported the good news back to the apostles. What is then Luke doing? I mean, why are these women recurrent in the story? Luke is suggesting that these women are reliable witnesses of the events in Jesus' life. And this is extraordinary given the time, especially because women were considered unreliable witnesses according to the Roman law. Therefore, naming these women as witnesses of Jesus' life was contrary to the social and legal custom of the first century uh, after Christ. But that doesn't matter because they were an integral part of Jesus' life of Jesus' message and of Jesus' followers. If we were to group the women close to Jesus in two groups, I would say that we can categorize them in two main groups. First, we have women who were with him or experienced his first appearances. These are the example we have them in the crucifixion paintings you have on the slide by Giotto, where we have um, the three Marys 
at the crucifixion of Jesus. And the second group are the women who provided financial means that this the term has to be broadly meant uh, and followed Jesus in his struggles. This is the example we had before with Susanna and, um, and Joanna. We'll see later what that exactly means. So women in the first group are often unnamed, especially in the Gospels, where they are mentioned with regard to their social status, like widows or uh, generally speaking as women. Um, I have listed some examples that can help you understand uh, or track them down in the, in the Gospels. So we have the women who were healed by Jesus, they are present in all the Gospels and we can find many examples, you can find a list in the slide. We have women at the Calvary, they are mostly in Luke and so we can find one more example, the fact that Luke uh, gives much importance to women in Jesus' life. And then we have women at the crucifixion. The Gospels do not agree on who were these women, but we can be sure that they were there. So once again, this is just one more example to show that women have been present in Jesus' life every step of his way. They have been present in his childhood, uh, in his preaching, in his miracle working, and in these final days. The women that we find listed in the second group are particularly interesting because they are very little known despite their importance. Their names are mentioned in the Gospel of Luke and we can't find references to some of them in the other Gospels, like Mary Martha and Mary Magdalene are, let's say, the most famous example. But for instance, we know almost nothing about Joanna and Susanna, despite the fact that we saw a few slides ago that they provided for Jesus out of their own substances, out of their own wealth. What does it mean? How is it possible that women provided Jesus with the financial help he needed for during his preachings? A possible sketch of Joanna. And in particular, I would like to give you a sense of what her life was like by guiding you through the historical reconstruction made by Baucham, who collected the scattered information we have about her life and portrayed her as such. He said that Joanna was likely born in one of the prominent and wealthy Jewish families of Galilee. In this case, it would make sense for her parents to arrange her a marriage of political advantage for her and for her family. It is also likely that she married at a young age because that was common among Jewish girls. When she became Jesus' wife, well, first of all, her husband uh, had to convert Judaism for her, but then that was not a big of a problem because uh, it was a common practice among aristocracy in uh, Galilee. But as Chusa's wife, she probably lived in a magnificent house and she became part of the would-be Romanized culture of the Tiberian aristocracy and the court officials. In this cultural and intellectually uh, lively environment, she probably took an interest in the movements of religious renew renewal in the Palestinian Judaism over time. And it is probably here that she met John the Baptist. And we know about such an affiliation from a first century Palestinian mural painting that you find here in the slide. And this association was particularly problematic for Joanna because these movements were not looked favorably in the Herodian court. Nonetheless, members of the court went to Jesus 
And Joanna was likely, as actually we know, she was one of those who went to Jesus, not just out of curiosity, but because she was in urgent need of healing. We don't know what her illness was, but we do know that the healing encounter with Jesus was an experience that changed completely her life. Jesus' practice of the coming kingdom drew together a community of disciples among whom the life of the kingdom was taking form in their renunciation of the wealth one had. And this was a particular challenge for Joanna because she was wealthy and she was part of the Roman aristocracy in Galilee. But she took on the challenge and she took the step of discipleship and that for her was a step across the whole of the social gulf that separated the Timberian elite from the ordinary people. Throwing in her lot with Jesus was a radical conversion to the poor for Joanna. But it must be seen, it, it, actually it's likely that the non-discriminating acceptance with which the community of Jesus' disciples welcomed all those who joined them that gave Joanna the confidence to risk her reputation among her peers, burning the bridges behind her in order to identify herself as fully as possible with Jesus and his movement. I think this is a pretty vivid sketch of Johanna's life, and it tells us a lot about women who followed Jesus. If we want to draw some preliminary conclusion, or at least the conclusion we can draw after one video, well, we can say that Jesus' relation with women is often envisioned by scholarship as a one-way street, but it was not. It was not because Jesus was interested in women and women were interested in Jesus' message. And it is for this reason that they were and became active members among his followers and his disciples. Some of them followed his message and helped him by providing shelter and food like Mary and Martha. It's especially important is the example of Mary because we haven't stressed that before, but Jesus is actually encouraging Mary to become more educated than she was and he reproached Martha because she was not allowing Mary to further her education. So it was not a one-way street. They learned from Jesus and Jesus learned and provided for them as they provided for him. So other women provided the economic resources to support Jesus' travels in Palestine. And it is intriguing to, and even a bit shocking, to know that women were the ones who supported Jesus in this way. We will see that there will be further examples of um, women financial help to Christian communities. And we will see that in the next video on the Acts of the Apostles. So from the stock debate or scholarly debate uh, that we have seen, we can for sure say that women were apostles and patronesses. Next time we'll see women as prophetesses and leaders in the early Christian community. At last, I have put a slide with the bibliographical references you might want to look at and you will find more in the written text attached to this video. This was the first video, the next one will be uploaded in two weeks and it will be about women in, as members and leaders of the first Christian communities. Thank you for listening.